I do want to welcome everyone to this afternoon's webinar uh, featuring UD alumnus and h &R Block President and CEO Jeff Jones. We're delighted that our students, faculty, and staff have this opportunity to hear from such an accomplished and thoughtful fellow flyer. And I know this next hour will be enlightening for sure. I'm, I'm Jason Pierce and I serve as Dean in the College of Arts and Sciences. I'm going to formally introduce our speaker in a few moments, but let me cover a few logistical matters first. Uh, first, uh, this obviously is a Zoom webinar and uh, Mr. Jones will be delivering remarks, but he structured his time for plenty of, of question and answer. And so let me encourage attendees, particularly our students, to be thinking about questions and follow-ups for Mr. Jones as his presentation unfolds. And I would invite you to post those questions in the Q&A tab here with the webinar. And we will be recording uh, the webinar as well. I'm joined uh, today by two UD colleagues. First, uh, Jen Howe, who is Vice President for Advancement here at UD. Jen will moderate the question and answer portion of our webinar. And second, uh, John Middlestadt, Dean of the School of Business Administration. Uh, before I introduce uh, Mr. Jones, I invite Dean Middlestadt to provide some further context to today's webinar. Dean Pierce, thank you so very much. Jeff Jones, Mr. Jones, welcome. Welcome back to your alma mater. Welcome home to the University of Dayton. Um, I had the privilege uh, of meeting uh, Jeff Jones two years ago uh, when he spoke to our business as a calling, part of our freshman business program. Um, and he really struck at the heart for me of the question that we hope that our students wrestle with in class every day. And that is, what is the purpose of a business? Certainly a business needs to be a going concern. That is to say, something that's here in perpetuity. But businesses also foster economic and community development. And to our opinion at the University of Dayton, if businesses fail in the task of creating community and creating economic growth beyond themselves, um, and fails to create opportunity for people beyond themselves, then we did not do our job at the University of Dayton in our preparation. I think Jeff, as you will see, embodies what it means to be a Dayton Flyer, what it means to ask the question every day when you come to work, what is the purpose of my business? Why are we here today? And how can we make the world a better place? We had hoped that Jeff would be here for multiple days this spring or this fall as part of as an executive in residence program. Uh, but we welcome him here for the next hour or so as a professional in residence. Jeff, welcome home to the University of Dayton. Thanks, Let us John. To Jason here. Thanks, John. I, I appreciate that. Uh, it's my pleasure now to formally introduce uh, Jeff Jones, who, as uh, Dean Middlestadt pointed out, is really no stranger to the University of Dayton. He earned his bachelor's degree in communication here in 1990. And in fact, uh, while at UD, Mr. Jones was the founder and the first president of UD's co-ed honors communication fraternity, Phi Beta Chi. Mr. Jones has held a number of executive leadership positions at truly a who's who set of innovative companies. He was the first president of Uber and executive vice president and chief marketing officer for Target. He also held executive and leadership positions with Coca-Cola, Gap, and the advertising firm Leo Burnett. Since 2017, Mr. Jones has served as president and CEO of H&R Block. 
H&R Block is a firm with a long distinguished history of philanthropy and community investment. Under Mr. Jones's leadership, it's reimagining its presence in its communities it serves, including Kansas City, where it is headquartered, and its 10,000 offices across the country. Looking not just at the bottom line, Mr. Jones has advanced a total valuation approach to the business community nexus based on creating sustainable connections at the neighborhood level. This is a really important message for those of us at a Catholic and Marianist university committed to the common good. And it's particularly important to you, the students on the webinar today, to think deeply about this link between business and community building, as Dean Middlestadt has pointed out. Mr. Jones, I, I do welcome you back to campus, albeit virtually. We're, we're thrilled that you are here. We are grateful for this time, and we look forward uh, to your remarks. Thank you both very much. I have to say uh, that's the most Mr. Joneses I've heard uh, in, a, in a long, long time. So uh, uh, please, please call me Jeff. And for everyone I can't see that's joining, I just say thank you. I know everyone's living in, in Zoom world so much to carve out an extra hour to be together. I greatly appreciate. And um, you know, I hope all of you one day get to experience the feeling of being asked to come back to your alma mater. It's, um, it's an incredible honor to, to think about how much time has passed, yet what connections remain and what connections look like. And I think for me, one of the greatest, uh, the greatest gifts that I have to give is just to share my experience and really hope people as they're forming their own opinions about their careers and their lives and what they aspire to do that, you know, maybe there'll be some small nugget that resonates and uh, maybe it'll, you'll remember it, you know, someday in the future. We're going to do um, a lot of Q&A. So, you know, please, I know Jen has questions we'll talk about and hopefully you will submit questions as well. But I'd love to just share a couple opening comments on, on this topic because there's, there's so much happening in the world today. It's actually easy to forget uh, the good that's happening in the world as well. And as a CEO, you know, one of the things that I underestimated was how much being in this role is automatically judged as a role or a person who is only interested in money. And through that lens, that's what corporations have been painted with. And that's what many CEOs have painted with. But I've, I've been very, very lucky in uh, taking over leadership of this company. And a really important moment happened my first week on the job. And uh, many of you probably don't know this, but in the letters H and R, that actually stands for Henry and Richard Block. Uh, their name is spelled B-L-O-C-H. But in 1955, when they were starting the company, recognized that it might be difficult for people to pronounce, so they changed it to be spelled like block, like we're all familiar with. Uh, they borrowed $5,000 to start the company, uh, and it was an originally a bookkeeping company before it became a tax company. And Henry Block, uh, for all that he created and all of his personal wealth, found ways to give it all back in so many incredible ways in cancer, in arts, in education, in community philanthropy, in big, big ways. And when I arrived at the company, he was um, really in his last years. He was starting to really struggle with dementia, but he made it a point to come down to the headquarters and meet me in my first week. And he said two things to me that were profound. Um, the first one was, uh, in, in his way, he told me that our prices were too high. And there's a whole long story I won't bore you all with now, but he was right. And one of the first decisions that I made many months later was to lower our prices for millions of Americans. Uh, Henry was right. The second thing he said to me 
was more profound. Uh, and he said, I hope you will help the company matter again in the communities. And I actually didn't really know what he meant by that. I was literally first week on the job. And what he meant as I learned in the weeks to come was like any company with long history does, there had been different transitions and different leaders over time. And through those transitions, the company had lost its way in several regards, but one of them was recognizing the importance and power of being a good corporate citizen. And so Henry had the, the foresight and the wherewithal at that stage to ask me, to tell me that one of his hopes for me was that I would help the company matter in the communities again. And I really took that to heart. And so there are kind of a couple macro things that, that have really shaped what we're doing today at H&R Block. And, and I'll talk more specifically about this, but I think the, the first thing that, that you all should know is the, the role of a corporation is a really active conversation in the business community. And if you rewind several decades ago, the famous economist, Milt Friedman, talked about the fact that, you know, in the early 70s, he said, businesses have one purpose, and that is to make money for shareholders. And that was very clear and very specifically spelled out. And then as decades passed, an organization called the Business Roundtable emerged. And the Business Roundtable is a, uh, an organization of the top CEOs in America from the biggest and best companies that all come together to tackle big issues facing business. And through the 80s and through the 90s, they, all, they reaffirmed regularly, and I'll read a quote from 97, the paramount duty of management and its board of directors to corporations stockholders. The interest of stakeholders are relevant as a derivative of the duty of stockholders. It's kind of wonky language, but it basically means job one is make money and work for shareholders. And last year in 2019, a really important shift happened in a very, very broad public way where the business roundtable for the first time in history said, each of our stakeholders is essential. We commit to deliver value to all of them for the future success of our companies, our communities, and our country. This was a, a groundbreaking shift for the, the CEOs of America to say, we can no longer compete with a single purpose of shareholder value. We have to think about our customers, the communities where we do business, our employees, our suppliers, and our shareholders. And I will tell you, th those comments uh, were roundly criticized. And a lot of people just said, uh, excuse my French, that's BS, that's just CEOs saying they have to do this. Well, I'm proud to say that in 2017 at H&R Block, given Henry's prompt to me, we recognized the same thing and two years earlier started what we call total value creation which is an understanding that the communities where we do business, the employees uh, that, that we serve and the customers that we serve, if we don't create value for all of them, our business doesn't matter. And that those companies that remain solely focused on shareholder value are in trouble. And we began this journey um, really being guided by our purpose statement and our purpose statement is to provide help and inspire confidence in our clients and communities everywhere. That purpose statement led to a series of major actions as a company. And the first one was saying, we can write checks, we can, we can do things in communities, we have a lot of people, we have resources, we have a presence everywhere, but, what are we trying to tackle? And in the context of problem solving as a core competency, what's the hard problem that we wanna do something about? And I was stunned that the company, our franchisees, our associates, our tax professionals, they looked at lots of possible things we could think about. 
cancer and education and supporting hospitals and supporting Catholic faith and other faiths. And in the end, what, what our team said to me was, those are all real opportunities and those are all real problems, but there is a bigger problem in society. And I'm gonna to read to you five facts that they presented to me. Number one, more than 40% of adults are increasingly disconnected from the community around them. Keep in mind, this is last year, this is pre-COVID. Three out of five Americans now say they're lonely. Nearly 70% of Americans don't know their neighbors. More than one third of small business owners say isolation is a big problem. And social isolation impacts health. There's a higher risk of death disproportionately affecting children and teens as a result of their mobile devices and living in a disconnected world. So our company said to me, we want our platform to focus on how do we and help solve the problem of social isolation? And you can imagine, you know, we're a tax company, we're not a public health company, but this is tens of thousands of our associates saying to me, we wanna have an impact and we wanna tackle a big problem. And what they said was, here's how we can do it. We have a physical presence in every single congressional district in America. We have 80,000 people that we can unleash in a coordinated way. We are going to provide empathy training for our tax professionals because we have 12 million hours of in-person conversations with people every single year. How do we use those conversations as a, as a bright spot, as hope, not just about tax preparation? How do we go into communities and improve the places and spaces where people work and live for the purpose of convening more conversations? And how do we do that through great partners? All of that led to our platform as a company we call Make Every Block Better. And Make Every Block Better really is about block by block around the country in partnership with the Kauffman Foundation, the online company called Nextdoor, Habitat, and the Urban Neighborhood Initiative to really focus on what we can do. All of our programs are, have very clear, tangible goals. They all have big ambitions over the next five years of trying to really have an impact on a major problem in society that frankly has only gotten worse as we've been living the way we've been living for the last six or seven months. And no one really expects that to be back to any version of, quote, normal in the near term. We're dedicating one million volunteer hours of our associates to be in communities to help people deal with tough economic times, to advise them on their business plans as small business owners, and to help rebuild communities in a local way. The final component of this is what we do internally. So one platform called Make Every Block Better is very externally focused. Internally focused, our platform of diversity and inclusion, we call belonging at block. And we recognize that in today's world, you can improve representation and diversity, you can have a sense and a mission for being inclusive, but until people feel safe and a deep sense of belonging, we still haven't achieved everything we have to achieve. Obviously, this, this sense of belonging was really challenged during COVID with all the social and racial unrest in the country, beginning really in earnest with George Floyd's murder and all of the tragic things that have unfolded. I will tell you proudly, we watched the University of Dayton make public commitments and actions and were inspired by how the university did it. We've done the same thing in five areas around hiring practices, education, training, policies, and community action. We've made our commitments and actions very public, and we've committed uh, in very uh, specific ways to race and gender pay equity 
and all the studies we have to do to ensure we're achieving the equity that we know we have to achieve. Let me just sum up before we open it up to questions with um, what I would say have been five really important lessons for me as a leader in helping us navigate this journey over the last couple of years. Number one is being a for-profit business affords incredible opportunity and responsibility. Number two, being an active corporate citizen actually is essential. There, there really is no choice today. And being able to attract and retain the best people, this is, this is required. Companies can't view uh, diversity initiatives or community engagement platforms as a kind of corporate social responsibility nice to do. It is essential to strategy. It is essential to business success. Another lesson for me that, that might be a little more controversial is that I've found there is a very fine line between advocacy and activism. And corporations have to think very carefully about their stance, their posture, and where they want to go from being an advocate to being an activist on all kinds of topics in today's world where there's really no clear truth and there's no unanimous view on what is right or wrong or what people should stand up for. I've also learned that being a place where you want everyone to feel safe and a deep sense of belonging means you have to honor everyone's thoughts, including those that fundamentally disagree with these kind of positions. I have as a leader an obligation to listen to everyone's views, but to also make it clear as a corporation, what stand are we going to take and to be unwavering with that in terms of our values and behaviors and listen to associates. But we have had associates at the company leave the company over the public stand I took um, with our racial equality work. They fundamentally disagreed with it. And I said, I will listen, I will appreciate all of your feedback, uh, but we are not changing our stand as a company. And that may mean you have to make a choice that this isn't the right company for you. And then finally, you know, I think as a, as a person in a career, as a team, as an organization, it's better to have bold ambitions than to not set any. And so to think that we can have an impact on something so important socially as uh, social isolation is incredibly ambitious, uh, but it is a problem we see in the world and something we're committed to having a positive impact on. So hopefully there's some thoughts there that provoke your questions. I would love to entertain any questions that you have. Um, frankly, on this topic or anything else. So, Jen, do you wanna, do you wanna come back and see where the questions take us? Absolutely, Jeff. Um, I'm gonna have to rely on our master person to turn my camera back on. It won't let me do my, it myself. In the meantime, um, we, we are getting some questions and so I appreciate um, the fact that folks are, are getting active here. You know, you gave us a lot to think about, and I'll tell you the first questions actually came off those five facts that you offered. So let me go there. Um, one person actually said, you know, interesting statistics, lots there to kind of, you know, process. One of the things that caught their attention was that three out of five um, indicating a, a significant level of loneliness. Um, you know, and obviously that's part of what's driving what you guys are trying to, to, to deal with. I mean, it's at the core of it. Do you have a sense of whether that's the same in the maybe underserved or poorer communities that you work in versus maybe some of the larger? Because again, you, as you said, you've got um, franchisees and locations in such a, a wide range of, of geography. Um, I'm wondering if you, I think this person's seeing, you know, are you seeing some disparities uh, in that loneliness factor? Yeah. So first of all, that statistic uh, is a gen pop American statistic. It's not. Um, in a particular cohort or underserved community. And, you know, I can relate to that. You know, when you just think, you know, the, the world that we are living in and we're raising families in and growing up in is one that is first and foremost in the palm of your hand. 
And that kind of connection is a fundamentally different kind of connection. In many, many communities around the country, across all income levels, the fact that fewer and few people, fewer and few people know their neighbors, uh, taking time to engage with their neighbors, uh, these are these are real issues. Um, and they, from our perspective and what we see in the data, it is spanning communities, race, income level, et cetera. Uh, it is not limited to a particular cohort or a community. You know, Jeff, you know, one of the things that certainly strikes me, my attention the first time I met you and then certainly is capturing our, our attendees today is you've got a wealth of experiences. You've worked for very different companies, you know, throughout your career. So no doubt each of them had their own culture, their own sense of community as they defined it. You know, how has that shaped the views and the ideas that you're now kind of putting into place at H&R Block? Yeah, it's funny. I, you know, I've, I've been a career mutt. I've always uh, been lured by problems. Uh, and I think that's what's attracted me to do different things. I could give you a really fancy rationalization in hindsight of how it happened, but it wasn't, it wasn't as intentional as it, as it looks. However, what I have come to really value is uh, problem solving is such a core skill in the world today. And the, the problems aren't getting easier. And so what I've been able to learn is having seen problems from different vantage points in different industries, all from slightly perspectives, has really helped me draw on a variety of different ways to solve problems, not just one way. What we would have done at Uber versus Target versus Coca-Cola versus a small startup company are radically different. And so when we face those same kind of problems today at H&R Block, it's helpful to be able to reflect on a lot of diverse experiences and not just one. And I think that's what's been most helpful. Yeah. So, you know, you talked about that sense of personal and social responsibility, and, and it was interesting to hear how that group of CEOs had started to think about their own company. When you think about CEOs themselves, one of the questions that has come up um, live tonight is, around the U.S. system and the fact that we have a, you know, we have a capitalistic system where CEOs can be paid many, many times, right? Uh, perhaps more than their average uh, worker does. Uh, what's your thoughts on how, you know, corporate leaders can really share in that common good, you know, in terms of ordinary staff that in many ways, you know, are part of what contributes to the bottom line and to some of the things you're wanting to achieve? Yeah. No, it's a super important question. And obviously, you know, as a public company, all of our compensation is public. Everyone can see everything. Everyone knows the details. And I'm actually in favor of the, the, the ratio system that was put in place recently where we have to publicly disclose the gap between, for example, what I make and what an hourly worker makes in, in, in the tax office. The fact is, I think whether it's my compensation or it's a frontline workers' compensation, we all have an obligation to invest in our people. And that's the mindset we try to bring. Um, how do we bring people new career opportunities? How do we educate them? How do we give them new skills? How do we train them? How do we continue to improve their compensation in the context of our tax professionals? One of the greatest things we give them is incredible flexibility. Most of them are retired from another profession and they want to work a very set number of limited hours. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's how we try to think about it. Um, I mean, there are, you know, I make a lot of money. And so, you know, under any circumstances, I make a lot of money. And I don't want to, I don't want to be ashamed of that. Um, but I want to leverage the platform that I have and the role that I have to continue to try to benefit as many people as possible. You know, when you see CEOs making hundreds of millions of dollars a year, most of them, uh, that's not me, by the way, but most of them are all coming forward today saying it doesn't make any sense. And you see people continuing to say, the, the, the equality gap, the income gaps in America are huge problems. Um, and so when you have the highest paid, biggest CEOs in America trying to do things to make a difference, I think that's a good step. 
So Jeff, there's some natural curiosity about kind of how you worked your way into being a CEO. We've got some ambitious students uh, that maybe want to know a few secrets there. Um, can you <laughs> talk a little bit about your, just your, your little bit about your journey? Yeah, I mean, and I won't walk through every step. You can read that, but I think a few things that have been that have been central to to what I've always tried to do, um, hands down, number one has always been uh, an insanely curious learner. And if you take a step back and think about it, and you know, I hope I don't offend anyone when I say this, but most people are going to work in some form for call it. 40 to 60 years. And it's actually shocking to think about that, but that's what, you know, if you retire in mid 60s and you start in your 20s, I mean, that's, that's what it's going to be. The key to staying relevant over many decades of working is being able to reinvent yourself. And the key to being able to reinvent yourself is being an incredible student all the time. And, you know, your learning journey in university is just getting started. And every single day I come to work, I'm trying to learn something new. The other part has been risk-taking. And, um, you know, I've said uh, many times publicly, job security is knowing you're good enough to get another job. Nobody is ever going to care about your career like you should. No matter how great your boss is, you know, like you have to take control you have to set your agenda. You have to know what you want to learn. And I believe you have to be willing to take risk and tackle the hard problems to separate yourself from others. And I believe when you do that, it'll be noticed and ultimately rewarded. Yeah. That's really good. You know, one of the phrases that you mentioned earlier that really caught my attention, uh, and I'm sure did others, was the idea about that balance between advocacy and activism, right? Um, you know, so let's talk about that a little bit more in terms of corporately, but some of the other questions that we've gotten are actually more focused on that with regards to individuals, right? And the idea that, you know, if you are someone who wants to be more involved in your community, but you really don't know how, you know, how do you find that right balance between, again, advocacy versus activism? And then two, you know, like you say, sometimes you have to speak up or speak out. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that the today's environment, right, is a lot harder because you may feel like you're advocating um, and then you're mm -hmm. viewed as an activist, right? I mean, yeah. um, that line is so thin. So what do you, how would you like to kind of maybe dig on that a, a bit more for us? Mm -hmm. Well, it's obviously a, a super nuanced point in question. And I think it's really different between as an individual, I want to get involved in my community. How do I do that from as a CEO or a corporation finding that line. So let's pull those two things apart. Um, on, this, on the second point, it is a constant, constant conversation with my leadership team. There's no other way to describe it. Because to, to your point, almost every topic today has many different views and in an instant can be used against you. And so when we make a decision, for example, um, you know, the, the morning, uh, the Saturday morning after George Floyd's murder, I reached out to a handful of our black associates just to ask them how they were doing. And the emails I got were so clear of how poorly they were doing. I knew I had to do something and it was just an instant instinct. I didn't consult with my leadership team. I just knew that we have so many black associates in the company that were struggling in ways that most people will never understand. And if I didn't say something to them, I was missing the point. So, so you do that and then you go, okay, well, then what? What do I say publicly? How formally do we say it? How formally do we tackle the actions? And I think you have to have some filter that you come back to. Mm -hmm. And the filter for me was, we are a very diverse company. I'm surrounded by associates every single day that are struggling in ways that most people don't understand. We have to be an advocate for them. They have to know that their place of employment is going to stand up for them. And so even though um, what we did and what I said wasn't unanimously uh, viewed positively, mm -hmm. uh, it's a choice we decided to take. 
We have done the same thing on gender equality. We have done the same thing on LGBT rights. But it raised an interesting question because I had an associate say to me um, at Target, not at H&R Block, when we were working through some things like this, they said, well, if we're all about inclusivity, then I want to start a white supremacist employee resource group. And it really challenges us to say, well, you know, we have an employee resource group for Christians and Muslims and Hispanics in Africa. And so where's the line? And what we found was, you know, hate speech had to be a line. There had to be a legal line where we said, we're going to draw some parameters. But I think uh, being prepared to take risk, having active conversations, listening closely to your associates are all things we try to do. Uh, and know that you might get it wrong. I, I won't keep rambling, but we made a real tactical error in the early days around our stance uh, for our Black associates. We recognized we made a mistake and we reversed the decision. So you also have to be prepared to course correct, I think, if you get it wrong. Sure. You know, I, so I want to applaud our, our, our student participants. They're sending stuff in pretty fast. Um, so keep it going. Uh, you know, one of the things that they're curious about, and, and I, I can ex understand why, is you sound really wise, right? All this experience or what have you, um, all these wonderful uh, different companies and exposures. But when you think back, what's the one piece of advice you wish you knew going into the working world just right after graduation? Hmm. Um, probably the wisdom of being patient. Um, I think, you know, and I'm going to, I'm going to project now that I have two college age daughters, I see students worry so much about the next thing. And am I going to get a job and am I going to get the right job? And then you get your first job and I guarantee you, you all say, when do I get promoted? And why is that person, are they getting promoted faster than me? And why did they get a raise? And I, you just, you just have this constant race. And I think when you're able to take a step back and I, I had a boss that helped me with this in my first job, we looked at what do I want to do in my twenties, my thirties, my forties and my fifties. And this first boss helped me understand that the decade of my twenties was about learning. That's it. Now, it's a little flawed because you have to be learning all the time. But he helped me just think through the long game that we're talking about and to just take a deep breath. You're going to make mistakes. You're probably going to get fired. It's all going to be fine. That's great. So a very UD question, you know, it, it, as the, the writer says, you probably know community is a big factor on Dayton's campus. Uh, how would you relate the community H&R Block to the community at UD that you know? Um, well, it certainly doesn't have the same um, Catholic uh, and Marianist values as kind of a core component, obviously, but I think it does have very similar Midwestern values. And it's something I immediately noticed when I got here. You know, I've lived all over the country. And um, when I first got to H&R Block, now, I lived in Minneapolis, too, and, and I didn't realize Minneapolis does not consider itself to be the Midwest. I thought I was in the Midwest. Chicago, I've lived, definitely Midwest. But when I got here, uh, the caring for other people, the work ethic, a general intuitive sense of right and wrong, um, those things are very, very apparent at H&R Block. Uh, they were part of what attracted me. I knew that the culture started from a net positive place mm -hmm. and the things that I would have to change and evolve about the culture were speed and innovation and risk-taking. Uh, but I knew we started from a very, very strong foundation and having come most recently from Uber where I left over an ethical stand, you know, that was going to be really important to me to find and join a place that had those values. So Jeff, when you think back around, you know, the jobs you've held, obviously, you know, you mentioned a moment ago, the pressure people put on themselves about first jobs out of college. Um, when you think about your own first job, did that shape, you know, your experience 
in, in de definitive ways in your mind? For sure. I was, I was very lucky. You know, when I, I was one of those students that, uh, and I, I'll say it as bluntly as I can, I barely graduated high school. I was a horrible student. Some of you know, I went to a military school to play baseball after high school, kind of learned the discipline needed to come to college, and then did reasonably well at Dayton. But I knew what I wanted to do when I graduated. I literally knew I wanted to work at Leo Burnett in Chicago. I knew that I didn't have an MBA and they only hired and recruited MBAs. And so I, uh, and I met my wife at Dayton so she could attest to this. I put on my wall in my room, every rejection letter I got from Leo Burnett. And I moved to Chicago without a job. I got an interview. I won't bore you with the story. I got my first job. And I got really lucky because I joined a company at a time where they taught people, they trained on business basics. It helped me a lot to think about decision-making and team leadership, things that have served me well forever. I think the sad fact is today, most companies don't have great training programs like they used to. So I think um, people have to take more of that responsibility on themselves in their first jobs. So let's stay in that employment lane for just one more question for a second. And that's around advice to students that are graduating right now and kind of the COVID slash post COVID market. Um, you know, H&R Block obviously, you know, expanding, changing in different ways. When you think about the marketplace, what's your best advice to those entering employment in the next year or so? Yeah, I mean, it's easy to say be patient, but I'll, I'll start there. Um, I firmly believe that the economic issues we're having are not structural fundamentally in terms of job growth and, and business growth. I think we're in a we're in a moment now where it's going to be harder. I also know companies are hiring. And so um, educated college grads that are ambitious are creative, uh, demonstrate resilience and leadership and how you approach the process of job searching. Um, you're going to find you're going to find jobs. I'm, I'm confident of that. I think something that I see students do a lot, and whenever I talk to students individually, I notice this. Sometimes I see students that are so eager just to get a job, they're not really clear on what they actually want to do. And they're willing to do anything, and they could move here or there or work for company X, Y, or Z. And what I always advise people is that's perfectly normal. But to the prospective employer, you can't tell them that. Mm -hmm. You have to, you have to, especially today, people don't just hire great people and then find them a job later. They're hiring for jobs 99% of the time. So you have to do enough homework about the company, the industry, the hiring manager to convince that person, this is what you want to do. And frankly, you have to do that in lots of different ways because no one wants to just hire a, a, a great young person anymore. And that's a really tricky part because you're going to not be sure, but you need to do enough homework to help that hiring manager believe that this is actually what you want to do. So, you know, Jeff, earlier in your remarks, you, you talked about leaving Uber based on an ethical stance. And I know you talk, elaborated a bit on this uh, when you were here for the Business as a Calling remarks. Um, one of our students who heard you speak then and is attending again today asked, you know, so okay, you had that experience where you yourself left, you know, on an ethical reason. How did you deal with employees who left H&R Block over your own ethical stance? I told them I was sorry to, to see them see him leave and, um, you know, it, if we can help find a job or write a reference, we're, we're happy to do that for you. I mean, I think that's generally the stand that we try to take with someone that decides they want to move on unless there's a unique circumstance. Um, I do have to draw a pretty different distinction between the ethical challenges at Uber and us being public about Black Lives Matter. I think they were quite distinct ethical topics, mm -hmm. but that's generally how we would handle somebody who decides we're not the best place for them anymore. Okay. 
So let's go right into H&R tax lane. You know, what are your thoughts about the link between tax codes and community building? Um, you know, I mean, tax codes kind of drive where people from high tax locations go to lower tax locations. So think about how many people are moving right now from New York to Florida, particularly given the fact that so many can quote unquote work from anywhere anymore, you know, starting now. Um, what are your thoughts about that? Well, first of all, I think we have to recognize that's a very small minority in the grand scheme of things. And when you keep in perspective that uh, according to the federal government, Treasury, 70% of Americans cannot handle the $400 surprise. So across this country, people aren't looking for tax strategies and relocating to income tax-free states. That's a very small subset of people. So tax strategy and tax policy, I didn't fully appreciate this because I, I came from outside the tax industry, but I now fully appreciate, you know, we are intimately connected with the federal government and state departments of revenue. And one of the things I've learned is the US tax code is America's welfare system. It is fundamentally how the federal government distributes uh, dollars to Americans who need it most. That's what all the credits are about. Child tax credit, earned income tax credit. Those are ways that the federal government distributes, uh, distributes money to people who need it. The average American gets about a $3,500 refund every single year. So, then you think, well, what are tax strategies that people put in place to reduce their tax liability? Companies do that in many different ways, some extreme like Amazon. And then people do that, like the examples you, you mentioned of they move to a state with you know, no state income tax. But I, while I think that's real, I don't think it represents the lion's share of what Americans dealing with, which is just getting by. So, Jeff, you mentioned earlier being a continuous or a lifelong learner. Um, folks are curious to understand how you hold yourself to that. So, you know, do you have some favorite books or are you more, you know, what do you use to kind of continue that learning process? Yeah, it's an interesting question because I, I, I almost think by definition, not one thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'll tell you some things that, that I do. Um, I think, first of all, one of the most important things I do that I can't do right now is travel to the front line of our business. Um, you learn a tremendous amount when you are, you know, in an office, in a small rural community with a franchisee, uh, staying in close contact with your customers. And that's, if I go to a tax office, I'm sitting down and asking a client how we're doing, what, how are we doing for them, what can we do better? I'm answering calls in our call center when people are calling in to complain about the way things are going to learn about the problems that we have to fix. Those are business things. Um, I think there's just then general curiosity. And one of the lessons I've learned is, you know, surrounding yourself and putting yourself in situations that are uncomfortable. I think we naturally uh, gravitate towards the things we like to do, um, but being a mentor to somebody you know nothing about or um, being inspired by going to an art museum. I'm an avid photographer, so getting lost in a city with a camera and just watching human behavior. Reading, yes, uh, my laptop is propped up on my my five book stack right now. Um, but I don't think it's one thing. I think it's asking why a lot uh, and just being an insanely curious person. So we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, you know, how do you, when you think back about your own experience at UD, you know, are there some Hallmark moments that you can recall that you really feel like impacted you? in terms of kind of your own personal and professional development? Yeah, and you know, there are incredibly powerful things and definitely some regrets. Um, you know, I was a student at UD who worked all the time. 
Um, you know, I was a resident assistant uh, my sophomore and junior year. I had internships in town locally. Um, I, I uh, paid a lot of my college by being a DJ for almost all the fraternity and sorority dances. Um, so I didn't have a lot of the living in a house in the neighborhood kind of experience. Uh, I met my wife uh, at Dayton. We started dating second semester, sophomore year. And so I think meeting her was profound. Um, being a resident assistant, I had to navigate to, through some very, very awful situations at a very young age with other students. Uh, launching Phi Beta was a really cool experience to have a lasting impact at the university. So there's definitely some things, but I, I look back in this patience thing and wish I probably would have had a little more fun too. Well, it's great because the, by saying that you actually answered one of the last questions with, that somebody submitted, which was what would, what would be the one piece of advice you would give your self back then your your 20 year old self and i think probably is be patient right uh you, you've touched on that a, a couple of different times which uh I, I think all of us learn that at different points in our career certainly um you know there's there's a time to be patient there's a time to persist and and then there's a time to really push right and so uh, that's right. i think any measure you know that's okay well I, we've really that's done right. a good job we, we went through a lot of good questions you know Jeff I, I think what we'll do is just leave you here with the last couple minutes to offer some closing thoughts if you would well I mean they were great questions too um, you know it's it's always tough in this world where you can't see the faces you don't know who's asking the questions so I definitely look forward to, to being able to come to campus and engage with the students in a more personal way you know whenever that day allows I think I would uh, I would maybe end with a version of something I said at the start, which is, you know, the experience you're having at the University of Dayton uh, is an opportunity that you will forever remember. And it's in your control to take advantage of everything that comes your way, working, playing, having fun, meeting a prospective spouse, whatever that may be. Um, don't put constant pressure on yourself to have it all figured out. Um, it will be okay, and someday you'll have an opportunity to try to come back in some way and stay connected and share with other students what your life's lessons have been like, and I'm just so thankful to have had that chance today. Well, thanks, Jeff. Um, you know, I appreciate your time and all your good ideas. Um, you know, I, I have to celebrate you. You emulate what we ask of all of our graduates, which is, you know, to give it your time, your expertise, and your resources, and You've consistently done that, you and your wife, and, and we're extraordinarily grateful for that. So thank you again for that. And thank you to the students who participated um, and offered such good questions along the way. You kind of kept us on our toes, jumping from personal to, uh, to, to more uh, industry and, it, and those kinds of things. Uh, so I really appreciate that. And thanks to Jason uh, Pierce and John Middlestadt uh, for getting us started. Uh, this evening and uh, I hope everyone stays healthy and safe I and mean, it wouldn't be a UD event if I didn't say go flyers in order to end it <laughs> in a positive way so take care That's everyone excellent. thank go you flyers. and good evening Thanks, everybody